So, John, welcome to Better Tech. And for, so, before we get started and take a deeper dive into the topic, the topic for today being five pillars of good design leadership, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Definitely. And uh, thank you, Amna, so much for uh, being able to participate today. Uh, I'm really, really big fan of the show and excited to be here. Thank you. So, how, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, how I got into design um, was a little bit. Um, of a twisting kind of trail. So I started out in um, more on the computer science side of things. I thought I was going into kind of IT. And I started out kind of in that in that realm, really loving technology, loving to understand uh, what could be done with computers and with technology in general. And then I stumbled on, um, you know, Photoshop, and I started looking into design and starting to kind of understand it and kind of really fell in love with design at a, a time when it was mainly focused on print and um, desktop websites, right? Like the mobile web hadn't really started at that point. Okay. Um, but it was really it was really interesting just to be able to, you know, create something in a design. And then I actually taught myself to do HTML and CSS so I could actually bring it to life. So oh, that, was, okay. that was something that was really exciting for me, yeah. Right. So, and this is something, so you got to interested in later on, or was like an early passion, like you knew right there and then that this is something that you wanted to do, have a career in. Yeah, so I, I started when I was around 15, kind of teaching myself design and the basics of development. Um, and then when I got to, you know, more career age, I, I had gone through, um, you know, college and, and I decided I wanted to step out on my own and kind of start a business. So. I started um, Altered Studio, which was a design and development um, kind of startup. And so for a while, I just started working on different, um, you know, smaller companies in my local area. Uh, I would go around and, you know, print out these flyers and kind of walk into businesses and be like, hey, if you ever need a website or any help, you know, I'm here, I'll do a good job and so on. And, and if you need any help, uh, let me know. And so those were kind of the early days. Uh, later on, I, I, I learned to kind of work with SEO and improve my website to kind of get more inbound marketing. But a lot of the early days were just kind of hustling and beating the streets for jobs. Yeah, but I take it it's been a good journey so far. Oh, absolutely. I mean, after that, you know, I, I kind of started working with uh, advertising agencies, um, worked for a couple while I was still living in Florida. And then um, around, you know, from 2008 to 2010, um, you know, obviously the market crashed and so the environment definitely changed. And so my focus really shifted and uh, I was talking to some public companies. One actually reached out to me and that's what actually um, pushed me to move to Houston, Texas. And so I moved there and um, worked for two public companies. Um, and that really helped me understand kind of the broader design space when you're working with a bigger team. Um, and how the work is, you know, divvied up and how um, business process is kind of managed. Okay. So uh, talk to me as a layman over here. What exactly is product design and UI, UX? Yeah, absolutely. So the term UX, I'll start with UX because it was invented first. It was a term coined by Don Norman, and he's a, a large uh, figure in the kind of design space. And he noticed that there was this um, kind of gap in the market between technology and the experience of the end user, how they would go about using that, um, that experience and kind of whether it was a good experience or a bad experience. And so back in that day, you know, you had computers and they were for very much focused on technical individuals. Mm -hmm. And then the user experience, sometimes it kind of fell by the wayside. So he said, hey, we should you know, create this new industry called user experience. And we should focus on trying to connect the technology in a way that it's easy for um, individuals to, to utilize. And it's a you know, pleasurable experience versus sometimes intimidating or frustrating experience. So that's user experience or UX for short. Yeah. And then product design is kind of a, a new term or a, um, a term that's kind of been recycled. So it used to mean a designer who did physical product design, so like an industrial designer. Um, and what I think the industry found is that user experience, while it was accurate, 
was a little bit cryptic and it was difficult to explain exactly what UX is and why it's so important to kind of the products and the businesses and the services that we all provide. And so, you know, when thinking about what encapsulates not just the, the research end of user experience and talking to users and trying to develop good, um, you know, scientific method uh, focused outcomes, but how do we actually build those into products? And so since software is eating the world, um, it made sense to describe what we do simply as we design products or we're a product designer. So it's a larger bucket that incorporates not just the user experience process, but also visual design, interactive, and all of those other disciplines. Right. And I think it's more easy for us to grasp our head around the fact that UI UX is really something that's really crucial for B2C businesses. Yeah, if you're dealing with mm -hmm. consumers, right, you want, as much as you want to sell your product and everything. So, but specifically when we talk about B2B business, why do you think product design is as important to them as it is for a B2C business? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about it on its face, definitely, um, we all see kind of the Apple, you know, products or the Tesla cars, and we see those, those beta, B2C products. Yeah. But I think it's, um, it's a little more under the radar, like you're saying, but it's definitely equally important for a company who's selling it. Let's say it's a software company, right? Mm -hmm. um, somebody like a, uh, uh, a MailChimp, for instance, right? They're used by a lot of companies yeah. um, or Stripe. Um, how important is it to have a good user experience? Well, it's very, very important. Early on in the sales process, you might be able to uh, have a couple of vendors procure your software, but if the word gets out that your API is difficult to utilize, um, that your documentation is lacking, that you don't have good sales support, right? All those things kind of reinforce whether a brand is loved or whether a brand is kind of um, avoided like the plague. So yeah. I, I think those sorts of things, you know, are areas where companies can provide a great experience to other businesses and thereby sell more products and, and you know, drive more revenue. Yeah, and at the top of your head, what do you think are the main challenges B2B businesses face when it comes to really nailing down their, you know, product designs, their UI, UX? Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of the big pitfalls are letting the technology lead um, unchecked too long. So within a startup, right, we've all heard the saying, you have to move fast and break things, right? You wanna, you wanna speed to market and, and develop working software. All of that is highly important. And the engineer in me um, very much supports and is empathetic for that drive to kind of create the MVP to, to not let the, um, you know, the perfect be uh, the enemy of the good. But at the same point, um, I think sometimes UX is put on the back burner um, and, and things like engineering and sales um, are driving the product. And if you let that happen too long, it becomes difficult because if you get too far down the road, going back and making changes, they become more and more difficult. You have tech debt, you have all this code built up that's wrapped around the way things work. And so a lot of times, um, the longer you go about ignoring product design or good user experience, um, the, the larger and larger that process looms and, and the scarier it becomes the more time intensive and, and you know, monetarily costing it is. Okay, makes sense. So John, you have years of experience in this field. So I'm just gonna come right to the topic. What are the five pillars of good design leadership? Yeah, so when thinking about design leadership, I think there are some specific differences, but a lot of it is, you know, what makes a good design leader is what makes any kind of good leader, you know? So I think a lot of it, number one, I would say, is caring for the people that you manage, the people that you're responsible for. And, you know, un understanding that you're not there to be a dictator, you're not there to, to run necessarily a team, you're there to be responsible for them. And so I think leadership is sort of, it's given as this, as this kind of privilege, but it's also something that's earned. And I think you earn that by um, going through the trenches with your team and making sure that you're delivering for them. And a lot of times that means if there's a mistake, it means owning that mistake, saying, hey, I take responsibility and going to your boss and not kind of blaming it on the individual team members, but saying, hey, even if they did something wrong, I'm responsible. So I didn't clarify the, the task or I didn't follow up or I didn't, you know, prioritize properly. And um, 
I think those are the areas where kind of you earn uh, a reputation as a good leader. Um, and to the contrary point, I think when the team succeeds, making sure that you're um, appropriately showering praise on those individual team members is highly important because they're there. And I believe everybody shows up at work to do a good job, right? Everybody wants to really put out a great effort. And a lot of times that it needs to be appreciated, so especially with creatives, I, I find. So um, just to uh, just a clarification right there, it's like a 50-50 thing. So it's 50% the manager's responsibility and then it's also 50% partly the employer employee's responsibility. Like mm -hmm. it's like team effort. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I think a lot of that comes down to, you know, making sure that if your software, if something stands in the way of their success that you go to bat for them, whether that's they need, you know, more training or software, or maybe they want to shift role in a certain way. So kind of, I, I think you're in a way as a leader, you're managing their careers and you're working to, in a sense, uh, raise them up. And then what about uh, the fact that I was reading some articles, right? Like diversity and inclusion is something that's really big in the design world. Is that correct? Yes. I would say so. I'd say in the design world, I think we've made larger inroads with diversity and inclusion um, than in some other areas. So I'm really, really proud of our industry as a total. Um, and it's great to see um, some really amazing design leaders um, kind of rise up. Um, and a lot of those individuals are people that are kind of idols of mine that I look up to, such as Julie Zhu. She's the, uh, the VP at Facebook. Um, for product design and so on. Just really incredible thought leaders in the industry. Right. How exactly has that, in your opinion, redefined how you look at body design? Because what, well, I, I, yeah, what good point. I understand is yeah. that you're kind of um, working on the, like, the user journey, right? So every step of mm -hmm. the design team is to like think about the user, right? You're designing for the user at the end. So then how Definitely. exactly does this principle of diversity and inclusion actually like redefine the whole Thing that you were previously doing yeah so i think um it it helps in so many different ways obviously um you know we want the design industry to reflect the world right that we live in we're building products not just for one small use case but for the yeah. entire world to be useful um and you see this I, I think more so in certain industries than in other the importance or the business value of it driving um you saw this with some some early stumbles in in ai right? And in uh, facial recognition software where it wasn't built um, with a diverse enough uh, user group, or maybe the builders, right, were just building testing on themselves. And so it worked primarily with, with one audience or, or one gender, or one race, uh, and not others. And so there was this non-inclusivity built into the product because the team wasn't naturally diverse. Um, and so I think that's just one thing we can point to, but, um, you know, just outside of it's the right thing to do. It also just makes an incredible amount of business sense to, to build an inclusive product that you make sure works for a very large segment of the population. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. And then going forward, how do you think, like, what is the future of UX? Yeah. So I think the future of UX, it's, um, in a lot of the areas that, that we've heard a lot of, of hype about. Um, that still need a lot of maturity. Um, so I've more recently been working a lot in the blockchain space, and that's an area that holds a lot of promise um, because of so many security vulnerabilities that we've seen all around the world and the ability to kind of build a very, very secure, transparent database that's, that's open and has unique properties. But whenever you have cutting edge technology like that, you need designed to kind of abstract the complexity down to a level where users can take advantage of it. Not every user knows all the different, you know, programming and parts that are inside a cell phone, but when it becomes a polished and tested product, then anyone can use it. And I think a lot of emergencies, uh, emerging technologies are that way. For instance, um, you know, AR, Google Glass kind of came out, but it was a little bit early. Um, and there were some concerns around, um, you know, kind of that invasiveness of the technology. So I think whenever a new technology is on the forefront, um, UX can really help bring it to a market in a way um, where it's effective. And you've seen kind of Apple do that so many times where they don't necessarily invent a new thing. They just invent it and they refine it. They take some of the um, interesting tech factor and they make it applicable or they bake it down or maybe they strip back features that are not necessary. Um, you know, 
areas of voice control, I think are going to be big in the future. Um, mm -hmm. Voice control, we've seen that with Alexa. We've seen that with yeah. Google Home and all the different home integrations where you can turn on your lights and you can, you know, uh, control your home in such an, such an interesting and fascinating way. Um, so those are a couple areas that I think are, are going to be really interesting, um, as well as, um, you know, AR. I know you guys have, have had quite a few AR um, experts on the program. It was interesting kind of listening back to, to some of those, um, some of those episodes. Yeah. But I think, um, I think artificial reality could, if it's used correctly, actually save brick and mortar, especially in this time of COVID, where we have so many people who are maybe afraid to get outside the house to go back to the local coffee shop or whatever. Um, I think artificial reality could offer some capturable, capturable benefits, almost like um, Pokemon Go was such a big craze for a while, right? Where everybody yeah. was going around to the parks, they were exactly. exercising, there were all these great benefits, people were making friends and connecting um, because there were these digital um, you know, objects in a physical world. And so I think with brick and mortar, if we want to bring that back, I think um, there's some interesting technologies and apps that could be built in kind of a gap between, um, you know, Pokemon Go and like Google Places, right? If you were to combine that in some way with like rewards, um, I think that might be interesting. So yeah, there's a lot of exciting things out on the horizon. So these technologies like AR, VR, 3D printing, how do they create more opportunities? Like if you were to take a deeper dive into this, how do exactly do they create more opportunities for think, thinking about product design? Yeah, 3D printing especially is really interesting, um, kind of from two aspects. One is, you know, the experience of shopping, right, on the internet mm -hmm. um, for the longest time has meant you could download certain digital items like a picture or a video on you know, how to fix my home or something, something like that. But when it transforms to, I go on the internet to download my dishware set and I can just print it out. Right. Or I need a tool, um, to fix my sink and I can download a wrench and I can print it out, you know, maybe even with metal technology, that's like a tremendous game changer because it's kind of mashing together these two industries of industrial design, um, and digital product design. So, it's hugely exciting to think about, you know, what might be possible. Another area that I'm really passionate about, and I run a, an Instagram site called Minimal Hearth. It's at Minimal Hearth. And it's tiny homes, van life, it's sustainable living, um, and kind of this craze of minimalism when it comes to housing. And there's some really exciting technologies out on the is, horizon. Is that a company? Uh, it's not a company. So I just repost other tiny home builders and try to support that industry. But I think it's interesting thinking about you know, downsizing and the desire to travel, especially with COVID. I think a lot of, you know, boomers and millennials are thinking about being able to travel their local countries um, and yep. see some areas that maybe they haven't explored um, during this time where international travel is a little bit more difficult. So I think with 3D printing, when they think about printing a house, printing a home, or even the potential of building um, low income housing that is safe, safe to natural disasters, this lower cost, um, and you could have potentially these kind of mobile trucks that could, that could have arms that could come over and kind of like pour in the three dimensional aspect, a house, that's a great user experience improvement. Cause right now it typically, you know, would take three to six months, seven, eight months to build a home. And it's tremendously expensive because you have all this waste of materials being cut and thrown away. And when you can print a home, I think it opens the door to potentially different types of designs, different types of experiences for individuals. Um, and, and I think it, it could do a lot of good as well. So and you had one more interesting point of discussion. Um, I'm not exactly familiar with it myself. So what exactly is dark UX and then what are mm. like dark UX patterns? Ah, uh, yes. Um, so this is something that's interesting. I think we've been designing for a number of years experiences and we've been focused on conversion, right? What are some conversion metrics? Mm -hmm. Um, so we're, when we're building digital products. Um, we want to keep users on the site. We want to keep people using the, the application in a way that may have long-term negative effects. And I think there's been a lot written about this in the, in the age of social media and some things that maybe we didn't have good enough data on. And those have been identified as certain dark UX patterns where, um, for instance, you might go on a sales website, they might have a, a tick down timer that's kind of ticking down 30 seconds to, to buy this product. 
um, that's a dark UX pattern because it triggers um, this part of the amygdala, this fight or flight response that kind of overwhelms our more rational, higher level um, thinking brain. And so areas like that, um, kind of endless scrolling websites where you never have to hit refresh. And so there's no kind of interruption mm -hmm. in consuming content. And we have, you know, especially young kids that are on for hours and hours and hours on, on certain um, sites and applications. Uh, and that has certain implications. So I think dark UX patterns are when you think about the intersection of morality versus uh, what might drive certain certain requested business outcomes, we just have to be thinking about the long term effects on our customers and what that effect would have on the brand and kind of balancing that out. So this is kind of an active discussion of like, what are dark UX patterns and what areas should we kind of maybe balance or push back on and try to avoid. Right. Okay. So John, um, enlighten me. Is there a, like a particular mindset that a person needs to have if they want to design for, for instance, like a B2C company or a B2B company? How exactly does that work? Well, I think the mindset is the same in, in an aspect, right? There might be specific business outcomes and we always have to keep our, our finger on the pulse of the business as they're the driver of the vision um, and make sure that we're not building a good thing that's not in alignment with, with where the business wants to go. And I think that's an area that within UX design we need to improve on. But ultimately, um, you know, what it takes to be a great UX designer, um, the, some of the things that I try to um, focus on and increase it within the teams that, that I lead are number one, passion. And so when I think about, because creativity is kind of hard as a metric to identify, like how do you measure creativity, right? Yeah, and it's absolutely. kind of this, mis <laughs> this mystical situation. So yeah. I tend to break it into other areas that are a little easier to quantify. So passion, um, and I think about this as kind of you give what you get. So as a leader, if you're not passionate about the next initiative for the next quarter or the product that you're building, um, you probably shouldn't take that role. You shouldn't take that initiative because you owe it to the people you lead to be passionate about whatever that is and to really connect the individual sure. contribution to the, to the value they're delivering. Um, and so I think about this as kind of like, you know, a band or a show you go see, and if they're on the stage being passionate, then you'll notice there's usually this, this uh, reciprocation with the audience. And so I, I think that happens that when you have a passionate team that's in a high morale state, which comes down to just being, you know, a good leader and supporting them well, um, then you just naturally have a much more productive and, and creative experience. The other big one, number two is curiosity. And so curiosity, I think is finding individuals who kind of lean forward in a way they might go around uh, a problem to find a solution. They're also usually lifelong learners. And so I've seen this, especially with, I've had some incredible mentors in my life and a lot of them have elevated to a very high place. And I've noticed um, a few of them have been able to keep their curiosity. And so they might in their own private time, they might code or they might design and they, they keep up on the latest technologies. And it's really amazing to see like, Hey, just because you go into a leadership doesn't mean you have to lose kind yeah. of your connection with the pulse of an industry. And so I think that creates that curiosity really helps drive a lot of innovation. Um, if you can keep that kind of fire lit. And so I think that just comes down to like exposing yourself to new things. Um, for instance, listening to better tech, right. would be a great source of that. No, so I'm just thinking it's like, oh, this is really important to keep the passion and the curiosity alive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, so there's so many different ways to do that. Right. And I mean, nowadays we have, we have podcasts, we have YouTube and, and all these different areas you can take yep. courses. Um, so it's really great. And then, um, you know, excellent. So I think setting a lofty vision is important, being able to measure that progress and celebrate it when it's achieved. Um, that that's really important. The team has to have some, something they're going to discover, something they're going to, to push for. And so setting that vision, I think, helps kind of rally everyone around uh, an idea that's um, maybe challenging. And then, you know, you get to celebrate when it's, when you get there. So it's really cool. Um, and then the last one is just, you know, you have to have a mind to iterate. You're never going to get it right the first time. And I think the more UX research you look at, the more um, you talk to your users, you'll develop maybe a better instinct, but ultimately instinct is just that it's a best guess. And so you have to really put something out there, test it with users who are real, find out what their pain points are and adjust. And this is that just constant iterative uh, environment that you wanna build that, that ultimately builds great products.
I believe. And as an industry expert, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out in this space? Oh, great question. So I think um, there are a lot of people, it's so fantastic that are coming into the product design and UX industry. And it's great to see um, all the the passion and the creativity and the energy that they're driving into this into this market. Um, some of the keys I think to be successful are um, to find a good mentor, right? Even if it's online, even if it's in a book, even if it's somebody you subscribe to on Instagram or YouTube, um, finding somebody who's further down the road and has a skill set that you want to uh, achieve uh, is really important. When I started, I moved faster I found when I was following tutorials when I was copying some of the greats and trying to emulate what they were doing then I naturally developed kind of this muscle memory where it became easier and easier to kind of riff on that and to develop my own creative style and so um, I think when you're when you're kind of chasing um, someone else in the industry that you idolize it helps you have a trail to follow and kind of move fast um, and then you know being able to brand yourself is really important. So getting your own domain, setting up portfolio, even if it's through like Squarespace or Wix, that's completely fine. Um, but just getting your work out there and ways you can build your portfolio. Um, you can do design challenges. For instance, the Dribble Design community has kind of a 30 day challenge where they give you um, a certain thing to design every day and you can sign up for that via email. It's a really great program. Design of everyday things is good too. Um, but ultimately, you'll find the design community is very, very helpful, um, and they're very welcoming of a new talent. Right. So that uh, wraps up our session for today. Thank you so much, Sean, for joining us on Better Tech. Oh, it was great to be here. Thank you so much, Anna.